And we continue that's the second part of the interview and we stopped at the question uh, about death. So what happens to the biology of DNA during death and how does consciousness disconnect from the body? Just speculate on that. Wow, that's going to be a difficult one to Oh, you end. just started, you, 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 you stopped at that point. You, uh, yeah. you mentioned death and losing a few grams of... Three or five grams. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. that. At the moment of death, I've, this is part of chapter seven uh -huh, uh -huh. in the non-local mind, which, by the way, ready to go to press. I just simply don't have the money to, to go to press with it. But I, it's, I've got 40 manuscripts uh -huh, uh -huh. right now uh -huh. that are all... Uh, Twelve of them are on path working. Mm -hmm. uh, how to change the movie? You know, literally. A B C D. Tell me more about that. What's what's A B C D? What's what's that? Path working. Change the movie. What is that? Starting with Malkuth and Yisad, mastery of emotions. To okay. be able to take your emotion and use it as a tool, like anger. Anger is a wonderful emotion to wash a kitchen floor. Right. <laughs> yeah. So it's about karma, working with karma? Karma is when you come from a place of wounding and owie, it hurts. Like when they, they said, well, we can circumcise him now because he'll never remember that. Right. Yeah, but you do. And it sets up in the subconscious, it will set up relationships on how you behave towards certain kinds of things dealing with your crotch. Right. I mean, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, exactly. right, right, right. Okay, and, and when, like, Steve Gaskins, uh, somebody that I studied with back in the 60s, he had a thing, a book called Monday Night Class, mm -hmm. where he later formed a thing in Tennessee called The Farm. And his wife wrote an incredible book called A Spiritual Midwifery, The Way You Bring a Child into the Universe Here. Okay. And just the difference between the way we're birthed with fingerprinting and mm -hmm. being whacked on the butt to make us cry and... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just all of that compared to how a dog is brought into the universe. Mm -hmm. You know, as a whelping as a puppy. Mm -hmm. uh, and the love that they have going for the different tits mm -hmm. um, is quite a difference in why the dog is closer to spirit than we are. And being closer to spirit uh, is like being working from instinct. And when you come from a place of instinct, you, by definition, do not make mistakes. And that's what a mistake is, is called karma where you have a lesson to learn, and you learn the lesson, and then the next time out, hopefully you don't date the same woman you did previously so that you have a marriage problem. As a metaphor, you try not to make the same mistakes that you made previously. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a little brat child now, 76 mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. old, mm -hmm. this is something that I'm constantly having to learn. It's terrible. Mm -hmm. Do you normally, are you normally this way about your detail and everything? You're incredible. You're right down to the, the dotting the T's and crossing the I's. I'm uh, sorry, yeah, I, no, death and DNA. So, at the moment of death, it's been observed that there's a five gram weight loss in everything. What is that? You know, what would be, what would you lose five grams of weight on? And Hammeroff, others, have proposed microtubule as a structure that's outside the physical body that might have some weight to it with structured water. I, I don't know that's the way we conceptualize things right now. And so I'm going to suggest that your memory of past lives uh, as a metaphor because it doesn't work like that, but uh, I studied with uh, Kubler-Ross, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, and talks about the Tunnel of Light. The Bo Bordeaux Thedal, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, talks about the Bordeaux Thedal, talks about what happens at the moment of and just after death. And man, according to that document, is a 
offered one last stop, one last choice. The moment of death, you have a choice of either going into the what's called the blue light, often associated with getting off the wheel, or karma, and going back to God, or the tunnel of light, which reminds me a lot of a birth canal, coming down through the birth canal again. Mm -hmm. And five grams of structured water mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is enough uh, storage capacity for 100,000 lifetimes. Structured water is one million times more efficient than gallium and arsenic, which is used in your computer chips and some of the things that we do now with our so-called forbidden zone, the place where we store information in our so-called check some error storage mm -hmm, systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, to realize that structured water, five grams, is enough for how many lifetimes? 100,000 lifetimes of memory? And so the key is to try to get toward why you're here. Why did you choose to be here in the first place? And often people would say, this is like a video game. We're in a matrix in the future where time and space aren't real, but that how many lifetimes do you want to play in learning a lesson as many times as you want because it doesn't cost you anything in terms of the efficiency of the learning process. Now, what does that suggest? We're in a video game in the future that we are chosen arbitrarily to learn some lessons in terms of how we want to become and how we want to behave. Now, I used to con convey the distinction between a moral man and an ethical man. Ethics and morals, the philosophy of Hobbes and Kant and some of these others. And when you realize that civil law is where you give up your natural rights to incur a moral obligation onto another to behave the same as you do, then you would say that, well, an ethical man knows not to cheat on his wife. A moral man won't. Walking your talk, which makes you uniquely different than someone else. And once you establish that relationship to self, now you are on a process going from what we call intent, <clears throat> coming from a place of wounding to a place of purpose, why you chose to be here in the first place. And once you have that realization in Egyptian uh, philosophy, they called that net or new the realization of net or new. Now you are beginning to open doors that allow you access to become in your mind's eye what you conceive of as God. And that, that place is only halfway to God. And to get to the other place, <clears throat> generally is going to require a teacher a master. And that's why the Torah, in biblical form, talks about the fact that there are 50 living masters on earth at any given moment, and that only two of them are for God, for men. The other 48 are doing God's work. Who knows what that's about? Um, that's the part that's so interesting to me, and why, you, you know, Satchidananda, Yogananda, Babaji, all the different teachers in our recent history have similar messages on different levels of awareness. And what I'm attempting to try to do is grok as much of it as I'm capable of in this moment and practice it, actually practice it, moral. Um, and <clears throat> the morals of each of us is different. That's what makes us God's favorite. We're unique. And just because we may seem to be in conflict with each other, with our belief system, it's not like that. It's that personal choice because of wounding that made you uniquely distinction from me. Yes, I know. No CMs and all kinds of little bugs out here. Yeah. I like you too. <laughs> all right. So one thing you mentioned is uh, seeing uh, yourself as God. Uh, that's why I 
kind of... Um, well, not, I don't see myself as God. I see myself <clears throat> as taking responsibility right. for the thoughts I choose to entertain. Because that's why all your saints in history have stressed the importance of training the mind to be able to be responsible for the thoughts you choose to entertain because that's what creates reality, your thoughts. And to have war and suffering and pain, well, in psychology, the forms that I practice, um, that's called projection of the shadow. And what I want to do is take something that's terrible, like the coronavirus, and somehow say that everything happens for a reason and everything leads to something better. Now, when you look at the coronavirus and the lockdown and the, the rioting going on in Seattle and New York and all the different disrupt of what's going on across the country in terms of civil rights being taken away from us, it's, there's no question that there's something alien that has been injected into the stew. And I choose to not participate. And the way I do that is to look at my glass being half full. And that's not easy, especially in light of the virus and the quarantine and resulting limitations that are taken away from us. What we can do in crowds and watching an athletic sport. We're going to school. Mm -hmm. And so I looked and I said, well, one thing that has happened that should have happened a long time ago was social distancing, personal space. We already know that mob concepts of when crowds get tighter and tighter, they change as a group consciousness. And that personal space was something that should have probably happened in grocery stores and public places like uh, football games. Crowding and shoving should have happened 10 years earlier than the virus. What else needs changing? Education. Obviously, our education is not working very well. Our children, in terms of what they're learning today compared to what you and I were taught, is quite different. When I went to school in second grade, I was taught Latin. Sum estest, sumest estesunt. I am, you are, we are, we will, they will. Say, they don't even do shop or home economics anymore. And cursive, the idea of having to go from right to left brain and from writing to script. What exactly are our children discovering? And uh, is that whom you want to have push you around in a wheelchair when your gums fall out and you're old and crotchety and need attention? So when I was in Chattanooga, I saw the most remarkable thing. It was a child that was growing wildflowers. What color do you want? You know, it's growing these different colored flowers to feed the homeless. And how that child felt in its position in the society, I, I have no words for it child felt enabled, it felt responsible, and could do something for an adult that the adult could not do for itself. And that was an exchange of empowerment that is a type of education that we don't even discuss in physics, or psychology, or religion, per se. And I'm guessing that I don't have the answers. I, I don't know how to do that. I've been part of experimental 
teaching concepts since I was a child because I was gifted and they wanted to make sure that I was educated and now that I'm this knowledge of being and all of this stuff and yet I know that I don't know I know that it may not even work that way that knowledge is illusion and the tonal in the Nagual this is Carlos Castaneda now when you talk about Nagual reality is that which cannot be known it can only be experienced and the reality itself is beyond your understanding it doesn't work like that it's you have limitations in the place in the food chain that you belong you're not at the top of the food chain you're not the center of the universe we are only beginning to discover our place in the environment and our role in this environment to be in harmony with everything um, I um, my, my quote um, scientific degree is a degree of a brainwashing <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so tell, tell me more about you mentioned uh, that's an interesting concept you should uh, elaborate just a little yeah, more should, on yeah copyrighted yeah, yeah. Uh, in the kitchen you mentioned about um, food chain and the planet can you mention that well uh, oh you want me to talk about the evolution of our concepts uh -huh. Uh -huh. we evolve uh, in a sense in steps not Linear, you know, not, not smoothly, but drink, 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 drink. Um, one of which is the change from astrology and planetary rule of, you know, which planets rule different parts of your houses mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm, and so on, mm -hmm. to astronomy mm -hmm. and how a meteor going through the solar system is going to affect the Earth. Mm -hmm. And then I got introduced to cosmobiology. And Yanif, uh, from, from uh, uh, Prague, had written a book back in the early 70s during the so-called psychic discoveries behind the Iron Curtain. And it, back then, you know, there was the space race with Sputnik and who was going to get there first kind of thing. And most of that was illusion. And, uh, but Russia was deemed that they were ahead of us in technology. It turned out back then, Russia wasn't anything. They were a bunch of superstitious people like uh, others with Kalugina doing her thing with moving objects across that table. She had a magnet under it, you know, to, to move the thing. And I was the one that busted Yuri Geller. I caught him cheating. And uh, it did, it was an unfortunate situation because Yuri Geller was gifted. He could do things. He could do things, yes. Yes, but he couldn't do them when he wanted to do them. Right. And so he started to cheat. Right. And that's, that's when weird, I busted right? him. <laughs> that's weird. I mean, he has a talent. He can do things. But, and you think, you realize what that did to Andrea Puharic? It took all of that body of knowledge and work he threw it out the door in one single effort because he cheated. Right. And it was an ego. Had to do with wounding again. His, you run, run a bunch of wealthy women wanted to show up. Oh, break my, break my watch and bend my spoon. And he started to do that. But he wasn't able to do that when he wanted to do it. And that was the part that was missing that where his wound supplemented his purpose. And it took Puharic, who was, in my humble opinion, one of our most brilliant scientists ever. He was from Israel, and he was brilliant. He was brilliant. He was, uh, I read his book on mushrooms. Yes, he did a lot of things, just <laughs> like we all do. <laughs> I wrote a field guide on how to go out and identify which ones you want to eat. <laughs> um, small steps alley. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't happen all at once. It's in small steps and one footprint at a time and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, because none of us have the answer. I went, I'm a true seeker. I, you know, I went out and I'm a true seeker. I want to know. And uh, 
A child absolutely knows what it wants to know and is smarter than we are. Why would we not give the child what it wants to know? Why would we force a curriculum? Brainwashing. <laughs> Yeah, uh, 101. Um, so, Travis Stock, 101. Um, I think that um, there is a need to approach our children differently as a natural resource, and that educational reform does not mean educational changes in the way we teach, but maybe we've missed the forest through the trees, and maybe there's something else going on here that we need to evolve into. And that's where I think the children are going to teach us. And that's the original theme of Cloud Atlas, where the child is so bright it knows what it wants to do. And what the adult's purpose is, is to enable or to act as a facilitator with, okay, what fertilizers? Well, this is what I know on fertilizers. And then see what the child comes up with in terms of how to use them differently than I might otherwise. You know, for fruiting and flowering and root growth. And Speaking about children, uh, Blavatsky speaks about the birth of the new, uh, new race, like we had uh, uh, hyper Hyperboreans, uh, Lemurians, um, Human too. We'll call Human them. is number five. Yeah. And there was a couple more. There was Lots Atlanteans and there was one more. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Well, they're indigo. And, and now uh, we are supposed to be, give birth to the new species of humans. Uh, Atlanteans want humans. So we're now we are supposed to give, we are giving birth to the new... Working under different rays of light. That's an eastern that came out of appendishads. All right, so my question Talk is right. ascension and uh, the, the birth of the new species of human. I mean, that should be in our children somewhere within the next few hundred or years. Or child within you. Yeah. Yeah, that's the other part of it. I've already, how did Tano put it, uh, the Lone Ranger? When Johnny Depp says, what do you mean we, white man? <laughs> but you're one of them, one of us, right? You're one of us uh, who are bringing that future. Like, you are looking forward and seeing way ahead of everybody. Speaking about your paper of 1973, like, we are catching up only now uh, with, with that. Well, or more detailed, the resolution of that yeah, information. Yeah. That's another way of looking at it. But now, look, look, 40 years from now, where does the humanity move? I have no idea, but <laughs> look at where we went in the last 20. Uh -huh. So, the quickening? Right. Or what do we call that, the singularity? The music changed. Did you notice the music that uh, everything youth listens? It's about, you know, eight times faster. It just eight, the beat is eight times faster. I cannot even take it. Well, there is a distinction in terms of classical music. Uh -huh. The Brett, which is a really wonderful resource that we have down here in Southern Oregon, like we have the Shakespearean festivals and so on. Um, I worked 20 years as a volunteer at the Brett. And I remember when Mark Knopfler came out off stage, you know, I like your hat. And we started to chat because I was working cleanup, picking up after the party was over. And uh, turned out he had some of my books. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but where I'm going with this is the new conductor took this 20, the first violin is 20 years with the orchestra. Now, that's pretty impressive. First violin is 20 years with this orchestra alone. And um, actually, 22 years, to be precise. And uh, with this new conductor, young kid, genius, she put them, the entire orchestra, which is about 220 individuals, on the rim of Crater Lake, and then brought in Indian chanting as classical music. Uh -huh. And uh, let me tell you, uh, music comes in all forms. And uh, I have written, actually, 
in my previous incarnation working with the military, three books on video feedback using geometry and uh, little electric currents on the forehead to talk to neurotransmitters. Uh -huh. And uh, called The Diamond Body, Electromagic, and Yogatronics. Okay. And those would say that any drug experience that you currently are enjoying, any of those are reproducible with your mind's eye just setting up resonant cavity oscillation. If you take a diamond body, which is um, Buckminster Fullerene, you know, C60, C120, and you envision it in your mind's eye, that's the throne chariot of God. That's Ezekiel's vision. And what happens is you set up resonant cavity oscillation, visualizing on that, and you can experience, I can do it that quickly now, experience a mushroom high, for example, which takes placebo from 10% to 60%. I don't get sick anymore. It's a state of mind and requires discipline in terms of focusing and training the mind. It's very difficult to do. And what you're doing is learning how to let it all go. None of it means anything anymore. And what happens next is that you leave the body. You hear a sound. I'm hearing it right now. It's the Shabbat. It's a it's sound current. It's uh, what Terence McKenna would have called zero point energy. It is a sound of music. Mine sounds like old anxiety. If I, I, you can make the music almost anything you want, but it's like the lost chord. It's the Gaia at the end of the rainbow singing, and um, I, I don't know how to describe it other than what happens is. You listen to that, and once you lock onto it, what you do is you you go home for a moment. You leave your body, it is not astral projection, and you go home to a place, I can tell you what it looks like. I, uh, it's geometry. I am now... in a craft floating into geometry, there are three of us. It's, uh, that's your future. That's how it's going to be. Uh, instead of two in a sex, there'll be three. It won't be physical. You'll be interdimensional. And you will be in vehicles that you control with your mind's eye. Mm -hmm. And such con or this place I go is like geometry, where my teacher, Sharon Singh, uh, wrote a book called Die to Live. Mm -hmm. It's the little death. And um, the loss of ego, uh, because I can remember things, I don't know how to explain that. It's, I'm visual. If I see something, mm -hmm. I take a picture and I've got it forever. I can bring that picture up and I can see detail. If I want to look around the face on something that I didn't notice, I can see the mole that's under the, under the beard, that kind of thing. I'm capable of, of uh, doing that now. And that's what I can do, anybody can do. So three, three of who? Like one person would exist in three bodies? That's what you're saying? I don't, it's not sex. It's not like that. It's different. It's uh, to exist. You have in our tree of life, mm -hmm. uh, the two primary paths to God on the outer trunks, male and female, are the hermit and the lovers. Mm -hmm. You either do it androgynously, mm -hmm. as a metaphor, mm -hmm. or you do it with a mate that most reflects that inner mm -hmm. feminine part of self. And that part changes. And that's why love comes and goes. Whereas friendships are the highest form of love there is. Mm -hmm. And uh, your inner feminine part of self mm -hmm. will change. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the path that crosses 
them, you know, the two paths to God, the one that crosses them, this one right here, mm -hmm. that is above Kether, I mean, uh, Tipperith. Mm -hmm. It's up here, mm -hmm. right at the throat, you know, where Doth is located. Mm -hmm. And it's humor. The hermit and the lovers and humor. Okay. You have to laugh your way through the whole thing. It's not going to, you can't get there from here kind of thing. Makes sense. And now that's in the physical form. When you project into higher layers, there is a, in a Christian alchemy, there are three. There is the Father and the Son and the Angel on the Mount. Mm -hmm. And then in the next system, there'll be four where Mother is added. Uh, okay. Yeah, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And then you have uh, the Spirit. Actually, in alchemical form, the basis of Christian mythology is a stag and a unicorn. There is a soul and spirit are within matter. There's an immortal and immortal aspect to being in the forest. The forest is everything and the stag and the unicorn, soul and spirit within matter. And we see that in many different forms where there's the dog at in mortal combat with the wolf, the savage part of self, the civilized and savage part of self at war with each other. And what you're trying to do with your two brains is find that balance of self, which difference differentiates itself from each other and is why you are uniquely different than me. And that is the richness of what man actually is about. And the fact that we can agree to disagree, and because in fact, the way I put it in magic is that all roads lead to Rome. What you need is a North Star to know which direction you're going. And so a North Star for each of us is different. A ritual for uh, the way in magic they would do it is they draw a circle around themselves. And everything inside that circle is me, and everything outside that circle is not me. And you distinguish yourself from, from the uniqueness of the rest of the universe out there. And that's what we do with ESP. We have ESP and PK phenomena inside and outside the body. Now, that's just one way of looking at things. It's a pragmatic, simple way of having a North Star, knowing what is you and what is not you. In Golden Dawn, uh, Dion Fortune did white light, where she would wrap the white light around herself as for a circle of protection. Walt Disney, Faust, Mephistopheles, doing his incantation of Mephistopheles, had a circle, and everything in him, that was him, and anything out there was that demon. Now, a demon, in that sense, might be a quality in you that you might deem unworthy, like jealousy or rage, just rage or anger. But like demons, when you have the name of the demon, you have control of the demon. That's like Bruce Lee and water. You have water as formless, and as such, it's, it's infinite in its potential. When you put it in a cup, now you can do something with it, like you can drink it. And that's containerizing something that's by putting a name on it. And puts it in a format that now you have edges to it, like your DNA and your proton cloud. You have a way of accessing the information in the way you've containerized the concept. But in doing so, you've also limited what water is and what it is not. And that's the other part of knowing why you choose to make this choice over that one. And that is uniquely different for each of us. 
And now I'm starting to get into some deep philosophy. It's more like theosophical society and uh -huh. yeah. So the, one of the messages from, from there is that the humanity will divide into those who ascend and those who will stay on this planet. And those who ascend will go to another copy of the planet which will be higher dimensional. Each of us has a purpose here. And uh, I, I, I have yet to discover what my real true purpose is. I'm close. I, I'm close, actually, but uh, I know I don't know because it doesn't work like that. It's a process. You know, that's a good Alan Watts teaching. He was one of my teachers too, by the way. I got to teach with him up at Cold Mountain before he oh, died. Wow. Yeah, he uh, taught Buddhism and uh, at Cold Mountain Institute and. Uh, I was smoking pot with Purvali at Khan and hanging out, being a bad boy. And Alan invited me up to teach with him because I was raised Shaolin. I'm a northern Shaolin form of Buddhism, which is quite different than his Japanese forms of Noshin Choshu and so on. And uh, just to give you a balance of what the possibilities are in embracing the nature of what Buddhism is which is different than Christianity. Buddhism, for me, was not a religion. It's a way of looking at things. And um, it is limited. And um, there were many different teachers in history that uh, would teach different forms of Buddhism. Uh, and that's why we the Tibet, Tibetan ones. My guess, is that that spacecraft, that spacecraft that's crashed on the other side of the moon up there is probably a Buddhist UFO, probably, <laughs> from a previous epoch. I'm just kidding. But uh, uh, that is, in my humble opinion, I have seen them demonstrate physics that we don't have yet, like where we were going to go with astrology leading into astronomy, and the Russian studies. The Russians back then didn't know goat dudes from pork and beans. Today, they're very advanced in their studies, but back then, during the revolution of psychic discoveries and so on, it was Prague that was leading. And Yanev had written this book about the lunar sex cycle of the female. Mm -hmm. And that was so interesting because predicated on where a woman was born, what part of the earth set her ovulation cycle for menstruation. And uh, if she moved, that phase angle with the moon and the sun changed, and her ovulation cycle changed. And it was an 87%, one sigma error coefficient on that, which was a perfect form of birth control. That is what cosmobiology began as. Then the study I did it was with the Department of Interior. Um, they wanted me to vet the correctness of that when the planet Uranus was in a certain geometry alignment with the Earth and the Sun, there was a three sigma error coefficient that there would be a major earthquake on Earth. It had nothing to do with sunspots or Van Allen belts or any of that had to do with the planet Uranus. Now. We don't have any known laws at all that collect, connect the Uranus with the Earth other than, back to astrology, Neptune, not Neptune, excuse me, Uranus is a higher form of Earth. It's a higher archetype of Earth in astrology. In astronomy, it's just this big planet out past Jupiter that's huge and has, you know, different satellites and so on on around it. In cosmobiology, it was significant to earthquakes on the Earth and when the Earth had Earth changes. Mm -hmm. Now, how does that work? Well, it meant that our concept of space was different than what we mm -hmm. see it now. And that's, in my humble opinion, I think where astronomy is going to go. I think we're going to realize 
that these heavenly bodies are not in real space any more than stars are, but they represent other kinds of things that are going on in the constructs of man, like a storm on Jupiter might mean a civil war going on somewhere on Earth, or uh, lunacy, when the phases of the moon dictate how people behave. Uh, you can try to do an argument on that one by titric tides and so-called pull of sodium and potassium ions in the body based on the phases of the moon, but something else is going on here. Um, back in uh, about 2000-2001, I did a, a volunteer-run project on astrology. Basically, at that time, people didn't worry about privacy so much, so they would provide their date of birth and uh, and then you can look at their interests that was in live journal they, pro they provide their list of their interests and we were trying to find a correlation between the date of birth and the interests and we were finding some some correlations not too strong and not too expected not predicted uh, but in any way I was speaking to astrologers and I was trying to find the biophysical or cosmobiological uh, link between the position of the sun during the birth and or position of the earth related to the sun and, and and the interests and I was trying to connect it through physical influences like the sun and the planet they change certain electromagnetic fields and and that affects the brain and so on but the astrologer said that uh, from their perspective it's not like that the, the the planets are more like hands on the clock. They don't influence, they just show uh, the state of the system. And the state of the system is elsewhere. So that's basically agrees with, with what you're saying, that uh, something is underneath which is invisible, but it's, it is the state of the system, the phase state or the, it's phase is a good word, the phase state of the system uh, and would correlated maybe polarity of polarization of the earth field and so on switching the topic to, do you want to exp expand on that or do you, should we expand on that or switch the topic whatever you'd like to do uh, if you have the end no i'm it. coming back to the virus uh to the pandemic um i started the research in the conspiracies and obviously there is a a great sense of, of conspiracy around that. Well, and people are going to try to use it. To oh, no, no, I'm thinking that it's artificially seeded. Oh. And then the conspiracy becomes even bigger uh, and, and nastier. Anyway, um, I was panicking that we are in, 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 in hands of some powerful conspiracy, but then I realized that it's not so powerful. And on, the, on this planet, the totalitarian order is just impossible because... Uh, the chaos always wins, and just natural causes make it so that, um, you know, none of the totalitarian systems survive, because when you try to put everything in order, the order falls apart. There is like um, jungle or rainforest, tribal, Bronion motion movement, which destroys the, the artificial order and creates the natural order on this planet. So, yeah, can you elaborate on that? Like, you, you might have insight into the conspiracies and where are we moving? Are we moving to, towards more, more unitarian, more totalitarian system or, or, or else? So, what would you like me to add to this? Yeah, yeah, what do you think is happening? How much of uh, central control is over things? And uh, are we moving towards... Uh, global government and uh, new oh, world. Oh, you mean, world. yeah, yeah. I think the correct answer is yes. All of the above. All of the above. Well, I don't know. When I see pallets of bricks yep. dropped in New York City, right where they're rioting, for no reason other than to have something to throw, I have to question, how did that happen and why is that going on right now? You understand? Yeah, mass media, like the unison, like the coherence of how much mass media is brainwashing the public is the best proof that something is behind coordinate. Somebody and something is trying to 
direct the movie. Right. But in my universe, control is a fantasy. Right. We're only here for the moment, mm -hmm. in which case we don't have control of the moment. We can witness it. Mm -hmm. And so um, Bilderbergers aside and world government or singular government, I think that we'll always have that conflict, just like we have good and evil. Mm -hmm. You know, and what's good for you is evil for me. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't work like that. You see, that's just the way we each of us choose to see it. But uh, we have a choice. Now, it doesn't seem like that. It seems like we're being forced and so on. But um, I, I like the Tibetan Buddhist ways of approaching things like, mm -hmm. please, may I have the knife? <laughs> What does it mean? The know. Golden Child. I, I'm, I'm oh, you it. haven't seen that movie, The Golden Child? No. With Eddie Murphy? Sorry. Oh, that is an absolute must. It's uh, where he is the chosen one to help the new Dalai Lama evolve into this little, from this little boy, into, you know, and help him evolve and take his rightful place as the leader in Buddhism. It's called the Golden Child. Okay. Yes, absolutely a must. You will. I'll check it out. And uh, I please, may Lama I have the knife? <laughs> proposed not to continue that tradition, and he thinks that uh, Dalai, Dalai Lama should be. Well, elected. one of the things I did for the military was to study non-life forms, non-human life forms. Okay. And <clears throat> there is a movie by Pierce Brosnan mm -hmm. called Nomads where there's a type of human that appears to be human, but they're not. One of which was Grandfather Joseph Montanga, who was the Hopi medicine man mm -hmm. that died on the crossroads when Jim Morrison was 10 years old. And uh, Denzel Washington did a movie about that kind of life form that's able to pass its consciousness on, in addition to your consciousness, a rider that's immortal that goes along with you. Right. And my study for that was to actually vet out that Jim Morrison did not die in, uh, in, in Paris, as had been outlined, but was smuggled out by the um, Swedish Secret Service and uh, is now living alive and well in uh, uh, New Orleans. And uh, I had letterhead from Jim Morrison working at this laser company and my military sent me down there to interview this individual. And what I discovered is that crossing over to the other side is a metaphor for something else going on. And that when the Dalai Lama, can, as a little child, can say, no, I didn't wear that hat, I wore that hat, having genetic memory of previous lifetimes is not part of being human and is leading now us to understand the different kinds of humans that, that might be on this earth, some of which are immortal physically in terms of consciousness. Now, that's just one kind of life form. One I did here in this region here when I was still living up in Seattle was a shapeshifter mm -hmm. that <clears throat> was where that tree is over there I saw this dog, uh, uh, maybe a coyote, uh, looking at me. And the coyote looked at me and started running straight at me. And just before it got to this tree here, it turned into a wisp of smoke and went through me. Now, I've witnessed that. I don't know what it means. Uh -huh. Does that mean that Bigfoot exists, Wendigo? And, uh, these other kinds of life forms like the Chuacabra and other kinds of life forms, I don't know. What I do know is that when R.D.L. Lang presented his Secret Commonwealth of Elf, Fawn, and Fairy, at the British Common, that was the first book on parapsychology, where he was talking about different life forms in the terms of fairy mm -hmm. and fawn and elf. Now, do they exist? 
I don't know. My daughter, who doesn't believe in any of this, was filming the solar eclipse a couple of years back when all of a sudden there was a light that came into her camera, went down into the garden and started moving around as a light beam. And so instead of filming the, the, the uh, eclipse, she focused on this little light that was moving around. Mm -hmm. Was that a fairy? I don't know, but I do know is that when I took her film and broke it down, you can, in some of the frames, see wings. Mm -hmm. What does that mean, that fairies exist? Well, my response would be, how could they not? In the terms of, if they're in your mind's eye, how could they not be real? And so we are, in fact, creating our own universe here. And that the physical world that we experience as real isn't real at all. It's a dream state. And that there are states of consciousness that I've witnessed and experienced uh, where there was more content to reality than even right now. And uh, especially when I meditate and I leave my body. That is more real than anything that I've experienced. And that's what Paul Twitchell would have called soul travel. Now, I don't know what's really going on. You know, my limited awareness in the vocabulary that I'm given to try to articulate this experience is limited at best. And it's why all your saints say that you shouldn't really be trying to talk about it should only be witnessing it and uh, is a way because each of us does it a little differently and each of us has a different place that we go so what's your place how does it look like how does your place look like I, I can describe mine but how is your how, what's yours mine I have no words for it it's really? geometry it's like uh, you know, it's like a dodecahedral universe. That's what I wrote, the dodecahedral universe over Roger Penrose and his geometric universe. Right. So when you described uh, the future human uh, riding in a special ve conscious vehicle and being, uh, being present as a three forms at the same time, it doesn't look like 40 years from now. It looks like more like uh, a few hundred years from now. Maybe less than one minute from now. Hmm. Hmm. So, can you like speculate on the fu closer future of humanity? Where, do, where are we moving? Like, um, I think the, that man future? is in the threshold of an incredible ev evolution in consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that some of us get off the wheel and some of us continue back because it's not about time. Right. And so when you talk about future, it's the moment. And we, each of us, know exactly what I mean by that, but differently. And so that's the, the best I can do in my limited vocabulary as a scientist. Yeah, one thing I noticed is... Um is uh, this mind control or mass media control now is spread to Google, Facebook, and YouTube. Well, they're, yes, they're kind of compromised. You, they YouTube. are all manipulated very strongly. And um, now, I, I, w I was especially upset about YouTube. In the past, YouTube was, was my, my best tool for research. I would find one video, and then I would surf many videos, finding more and more information I would usually scroll to the middle of the video look at the eyes of the speaker and see if I Have like that like that or if yeah. I trust that or yeah. not but now now they in, in the past it was very coherent I could improve and improve and improve now they give you everything else except what you need it's really hard to find what even the from the past it's hard to find the videos which are good so uh, same thing on Amazon same thing in Google they they feed you messed up information and um, 
I agree. And we I moving agree. to much more of the mind control and uh, artificial intelligence control. So can you speculate on that? So gang stalking is um, a way of driving someone crazy where you'll never know what really happened. It doesn't work like that. The information is given to you in such a manner that there's no way to get there from here kind of thing. It's, um, this was a protocol that came out of Travis Stock where um, there's some end game weapons involved here. Uh, the secret squad or silent sound, you know, like synthetic telepathy, some of the other technologies I worked on, some of that myself in the, in the 70s. We, Alan Frey, had discovered that man has another sensory motor input in the 0.3 to 3 gigahertz. It's microwave band. It's temporal lobes mm -hmm. heat up, they begin to ring, and you can heterodyne audio onto that bandwidth, okay. and you can hear it in your head without going through the ears. Uh -huh. um, now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> well, uh, for the hearing impaired, it's a breakthrough. Uh, an astronaut in deep space, it's a breakthrough communication. Um, to a kid on antipsychotics, uh, hearing them in his head, and then having a handler touching him with scopolamine, and now you have a shooter that is, uh, for no explanation, a kid going going uh, rampant. And if they put 5G on every household in America, they won't need an army or a police force. How many people are on psychotics in your neighborhood? There's your police force as a possibility. And when I say that, it doesn't mean that that's what they're going to do. But if it's a possibility, you can count on it. Yeah, yeah. I, I researched um, millimeter waves, which are 3.3 .3 gigahertz and up, and this is part of the 5G spectrum. Well, yeah, you and, need that bandwidth to carry that frequency. And yeah. apparently, this um, this frequency taps into our uh, biofield very strongly, and it can be used for uh, th therapy and healing, and can cure even diseases, very powerful diseases, and... Um, so that's the deal. It's all technology has two faces to it. The good and the bad. Mm -hmm. And really it's neither. It's its application and intent. Mm -hmm. And that's again, trying to use it as a weapon for controlling people. Well, control is a fantasy. So what happens next is you have the evil or more you know, disrespect of what's happening. I remember when they first started those studies on antipsychotics in prisons. The prisons were mostly uh, strung out on heroin, and uh, they started to look at antipsychotics in the prisons, and today now is a beta testing. Uh, the prisons are all now pretty much on antipsychotics rather than heroin and, and morphine. And uh, you give that to a child, and uh, the likelihood of unstableness in that child is one in four. And so for them to prescribe those kinds of medicines for children is a crime, in my humble opinion, and is a potential weapon for police forces and other kinds of things. There's always, in all the school shootings, in every single one of them, the first reports are there's a second shooter. That's your handler with scopolamine. And that's another thing I did for the military. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, um, um, there is a video interview of the guy who, sh who killed John Lennon. And he mentions that at some point he heard in his head uh, the voice, should now. Voice is in his head. Yeah, yes. yeah.
confusing him. No, the, the, the voice was saying, shoot now. Now, now it's time to shoot. So I think at that time they already had the, the technology to, to deliver voice into the, it's 1980. Um, now I interviewed, actually I was asked to help um, a patient or a Reiki patient. He wanted my help and he had voices in his head and um, they were not speaking non-stop uh, 24 hours all, all awake time they would speak to him and they would give him a lot of support so it's nice when there are two voices saying like you know whatever you do how good you are how well you're doing and supporting you in anything you do like even if it is the stupidest thing they would still support you so he was pretty much happy about the voices but he clearly thought that these were not human voices because they had like non-human logic they sounded like a computer program which which was artificial intelligence trying to control him. And they were pretty much human in, in terms of uh, the messages which they gave, gave to him. So he thought that these are the military or some other human secret organization which implanted him and sent him the... Uh, and sometimes they would take control of his body. So he would lose time. And, um, and he also mentioned that he was uh, taken to a foreign country to... Uh, military type of base for training and they did something for him there so and and his family had a military history so so it was very interesting but um my question is first about the technologies involved and second um where is it all going it looks like they want uh, everybody to be like um uh, controlled this way well kurtzwell talks about singularity where everybody is tapped into uh the computer that runs everything. The thing is, uh, what you describe are rays of light, like each of us has a different star that we follow. Mm -hmm. um, these are the chakras, you know, you're the gold light and the, I'm the violet light and da 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 da. Uh, these are tendencies of us because of wounds and experience. And I feel that that is the first purpose of meditation, is to train the mind so that it becomes a tool rather than an, an arbitrary going wherever it wants to like a little brat child might, you know, with no discipline at all. It just off goes. And to do that, there have been Travis Stock and other studies on how to control that in people so that they're not aware of their subconscious tendency toward da 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 da, whatever they might want to be doing. And you nudge somebody and you don't force them, you nudge them, and at some point, the least common resistance, and off you go into following some kind of path that, like the Son of Sam where you're listening to a voice inside your head that isn't real. That's one of the purposes of meditation and diary entry and logging and keeping a diary is to discover who you are and draw that circle on what's you and what is not you. And that's the North Star that I talk about. And uh, everybody needs to have a North Star. It's different for each of us. But all roads lead to Rome. You just need a North Star to know what direction you're moving, whether you're moving toward or away from your purpose. And that's the part that we all need and what is the purpose of meditation, training, training the mind. I also think that there should be a, a certain, there should be some training to resist those uh, messages. Like some people, like experienced yogis wouldn't be Or you can acceptable. dismiss them by not even paying attention to right. them. You don't have to act to be active about it. You can be like not notice them. That's what another thing of meditation does. It puts you in a place of quietness where you can hear your own thoughts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's time to start closing the discussion and um do you have any messages or questions which you wanted to speak about before we finish? No, I'm pretty much worn out. <laughs>
You've actually challenged me pretty good for one day. Oh, okay. Well, no, 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 you're you're good. You got right down into the core issues of things. Yeah, you are writing your biography, and I just wondered if you wanted to speak about your childhood. How did it make you? Oh, um, I remember my third grade report card said, Ricky is very disruptive. He asks too many questions. In fourth grade, they discovered I couldn't read English, and so I had to stay after school every night reading, learning how to read English. In fifth grade, I read every single science fiction novel in the local public library that had a little atom on it. I read them all. And sixth grade, <laughs> then they said, well, uh, he's kind of uh, really seriously disruptive. We, we, we need to put him on Ritalin. And my mother wouldn't let him do that. And so they tried to make it embarrassing for me where I had to leave in the middle of noon every day to go to special counseling, see what was wrong with me. And that's when they discovered, well, there's nothing wrong with this kid. He's, he's brilliant. <laughs> you know? And so then they wanted to do the next thing. They wanted to advance me in school. And my mother, thank you, mom, didn't let them do that to me. And so basically I had to suffer what you had to go through to get to where you are. Uh -huh. And uh, so instead of being an idiot savant that drools and hums and bobs, which I do, um, I'm a functioning savant. <laughs> and uh, kind of remember a little bit of what it was like to be glory days when I had a different kind of awareness than I do now. I'm humbled by realizing that uh, all children were like me. I just didn't grow up. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, that's fourth grade, a four-year-old are beyond genius. Their level of learning curve and picking up styles and mannerisms is unbelievable. Yeah, in biology, we it's, it's now accepted theory that um, Dogs are wolves with, that didn't evolve to adults, so dogs are real puppies, and that humans also have uh, uh, undeveloped adults. There is a lot in human which is uh, childish. Uh, there are certain uh, genes which are That's turned, humanistic psychology, yeah. Yeah, turned off, and uh, we basically, we are undeveloped in many ways. So that would suggest that our evolution further is to get even more undeveloped and become even more childish. Like, in America now, uh, people get become adults much later than in other countries because, because uh, America can afford it. But now the, the development slow, slows down a lot. Like, there, there are people in 30s which still try to choose their... That's why I don't really appreciate much being around Gen X and the way they drive. Very selfish, like, this is my right. Whereas being more courteous and paying attention to your needs as a driver. But uh, did you have a grandfather or grandparents who brought you up? Yes, I did. I did. Yes, I did. As a matter of fact, yeah. My mom was into China theater, and so my grandmother was the one that raised me. Uh -huh. uh, at certain periods of my ch childhood, not all of my childhood, but certain periods of my childhood. And um, she uh, was the woman that worked with the Birdman of Alcatraz, Robert Stroud. She was German roller canary songbirds out of Seattle. And uh, he had invented uh, a cure for bird diseases that were rampant in songbirds at that mm -hmm. time. And so my grandmother and her, him became very good friends. And um, my grandfather, I thought he was very cool. He carried a gun because he was a mailman on a rail car going from Seattle to Spokane. He sorted mail. He had to carry a gun. I thought, Grandpa, wow. <laughs> yeah. But um, now I realize that I was blessed. My mother ran a spy network that would make Gordon Duff's current spy network in 
tall in comparison. Mom was with the Cutting and Associates, which um, industrial espionage. Mom placed secretaries for executive vice presidents for Boeing and Douglas United Nuclear and Battelle and um, I don't know, Bethlehem Steel, that kind of thing. Only thing was, uh, they didn't work for those men. They worked for my mother. <laughs> and so when she was alkali halide, Kodak, during World War II, and that's why I got to grow up alone in the Philippines. They were into a China theater, and she stuck me in Buddhist missionary schools when I was wow. a little boy. Yeah, I learned how to fight on the streets of the Philippines because I was Caucasian. I also in respect of that event, also learned how to play chess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I wish we could continue. I guess we'll have to continue um, through distant uh, Zoom. Uh, well, and more visits if you'd like. More to, visits, yes. More visits. This time maybe come up and we'll go to the ocean and hang out there for a little while and go uh -huh. through the redwoods. And uh -huh. Yeah, I, I like Oregon a lot. It's, uh, it's so much greener. Yeah. And uh, then, I, if you'd like, I'll take you up into Canada and show you where we're growing mushrooms uh, wow. in the forest, wild, at forest farming. We uh, drill holes in the, in the um, birch to grow chaga, and mm. I farm it now in, in the... Are you traveling there once in a while? I'm sorry? Are you traveling there regularly? I, I will probably be going up this fall. Wow. I'll let you know. If you'd like to travel along, we'll have a little caravan. Wow. Yeah. Psychedelic mushrooms, I can show you how to grow your own. It's not illegal to grow them. It's illegal to extract them or to sell them. That's because of my books on mushrooms. I wrote those specifically to keep them out of the Uniform Control Substance Act. Nice. Right. I have so many questions. I just hold my tone and um, I would like to thank you for the um, interview. It was a pleasure and I think it was one of the best interviews I took that, uh, from you. At, uh, well, we'll always have more of them to look forward to if you'd like. That would right, be my you. pleasure. Yeah. All right. At this point, I press the stop button. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> Au revoir. <laughs>